have a if you have a problem you can call Marcy's cell phone I guess or you can put something in the chat and I'm going to try to not put my mug right up in your face this time um, the and give you also something of a broad scope um, as opposed to just diving right into my presentation on this last period. So in the first three sessions, what I've tried to do is give you an idea of the depth and breadth of the resistance to slavery here in the, col the American colonies in the United States and thus the potential that we didn't have to go through a civil war to get rid of it. But my view is that the to actualize that potential, you had to have an economic system put in place based on industrial and scientific progress, which would support the end of slavery. And I believe that Alexander Hamilton actually initiated such a system, um, as I outlined somewhat last week. Um, and But it was always under attack um, by many forces, North, South, and most importantly, I think, Great Britain, which was the financial power of the world. You may recall they had an empire up until World War I, <laughs> and they were the most powerful empire up through at least after the Civil War. Um, so Hamilton's principles of political economy didn't die, even in periods when they weren't implemented. They have been revived again and again in our most prosperous periods, particularly the Lincoln period, but they were defeated for long periods of time. And one of those periods of time is what we're discussing today, of eight, about 1800 to 1832. Uh, during most of that time, Hamilton's principles were not only under attack, they were being eviscerated, one might say, to use a big word. Uh, and the fact that that occurred is what, in my view, led us to the inevitability of war. So because of the relationship between the slavery issue and the manufacturing issue, what I'm going to be doing this time is tracking both the progress and defeats for both of, on both of those issues, going back and forth. And I hope that's not too confusing. And uh, so let us begin. Okay. Marcy? I just wanted to ask if you could set the stage for 1800 is, I mean, Hamilton is dead, correct? And the, who's the president? In no, Hamilton is not dead. Uh, I'm he gonna, hasn't died yet. I, okay. I'll get into that. Okay. okay. So, as I said, my, my thesis here is that the battle to eliminate slavery was totally interconnected and depended upon the battle to achieve a manufacturing industrial policy. And we, what 1800 marks is the beginning of the Jefferson era. Uh, 1800 is the time there, Hamilton leaves the office of the treasury actually in 1795. Washington continues for another year, but Hamilton continues very active even during the Adams administration, which is the next one. That one ends in 1800 and Jefferson comes in. And this represents a major shift of emphasis uh, to the detriment of the country, in my view. Jefferson was not involved in the development of the Constitution at all. He was in Europe at the time. And over the course of the 90s, 
As we discussed last week, he opposed the establishment of the bank, he opposed the development of manufacturers, and he asserted that states' rights. He asserted the, that the Constitution was not we the people, it was a compact between the federal, federal authorities and the state governments, and therefore that the states had a much more independent role, even when it meant opposing the federal government and perhaps going for secession, nullification, potentially secession. So that was his view coming in, and that was carried out. The, he had great, you know, he continued his opposition to the promotion of manufacturers, which was the major point, one of the major points of the Bank of the United States. Uh, he opposed the bank and he opposed federal support for infrastructure. It's a little misleading to say he opposed all infrastructure. It, he didn't, you know, on the state level, he could support that, but he definitely did not want to see us industrializing. And uh, in fact, one of the first things he did when he appointed his treasury secretary, who was Albert Gallatin, was to say, figure out a way to investigate the Bank of the United States and get rid of it. And of course, there had been investigations of the Bank of the United States throughout the entire 90s. Everybody would accuse Hamilton of having carried out fraud and be on the take and, you know, corruption with his with cronies and so forth. But they never were able to prove anything because it didn't exist. And Gallatin did an incredibly detailed re-review of the entire process and resulted in saying, I can't change this system if I change this system, which recall was not only for the standpoint of providing credit for the, for, and a, for the federal government, which it received the revenues of the federal government and was a, helped uh, as a fiscal agent in that respect, uh, and not, it had also created effectively a national currency allowing for great, greater ease in commercial transactions and tax collection uh, from one part of the country to the other. Um, it had not only done that, but, um, and it had created a certain level of prosperity with the credit rating of the United States uh, had gone way up uh, because we were paying our installments on the debt, we were paying interest. And uh, Gallatin said, you take this apart and this, it's gonna fall apart. So that didn't happen. However, uh, Gallatin, who was of, this, was of the same mind as Jefferson in terms of the Constitution, he actually had opposed the establishment of the Constitution. Uh, and he was what you would call today a debt hawk. <laughs> His major objective in taking over the Treasury was not to build the country, but was to reduce the debt. Uh, Hamilton you, has been accused of wanting to increase the debt. He did not want to increase the debt. What he wanted to do was use the bonded debt as a source of credit to build up the physical productive capability of the country. Because the only way in the long term you can actually pay your debts is if your productivity and production is increasing. So on the long, Hamilton did want to pay down the debt, but not so rapidly that you didn't have that source of credit, because as you know, on one side of debt is credit. Uh, uh, Jefferson didn't like credit, although he was a huge debtor, <laughs> sort of ironic personally, um, and neither did Gallatin. So while he saved the Bank of the United States, 
Gallatin changed its priorities. And the priority at this point was pay off your debts uh, and cut the budget. Uh, he cut orders for new frigates and other expanded Navy operations. He reduced taxes, particularly all internal taxes, and like the whiskey tax, um, which was not very high, really, if you want to look at it. And Hamilton had reduced it, uh, in fact, in response to the objections of those in the interior who were very upset about it. But anyway, he eliminated those and he opposed federal spending for infrastructure, that this was not a uh, something that the government should do. It should concentrate on paying off its debts. So that the consequences of some of this uh, will become obvious in a while. Despite that outlook, which was carried forward uh, in as an austerity policy, um, both Jefferson and Gallatin were extremely happy to be able to use the Bank of the United States for an expansion of the debt, i.e. the Louisiana purchase, uh, when it came to 1803. And in fact, many have argued that Jefferson went beyond the kind of literal constitutional permissions that he required of other people in order to carry out that purchase without it going through Congress. But anyway, uh, that did happen. Um, and it obviously had great consequences for the country. Uh, the big consideration and, and most of the, what is called the Hamiltonian party, the Federalists opposed that partly because they wanted to have concentration on development of the part of the country that already existed. But Hamilton himself did not oppose it. Uh, he thought it was a great idea. He was still alive till 1804. Um, and the John Quincy Adams, whom we'll hear about later, also uh, was in favor of it because they were looking at a continental republic uh, being developed. The question is what was gonna happen in that territory. And on that, of course, we ran into some big problems where the, with the expansion of the slave system. The other significant thing that was done was the approval for the development of the National Road. Now, those of you, since you all live in this area, you're probably somewhat familiar with the National Road, it goes through Maryland, uh, out there toward Shepherdstown. It was, but the part that, that the part in Maryland had already been Done the part that is was approved by Congress actually was started in Cumberland, Maryland, and was scheduled to go west to Wheeling, I believe, um, and in, in its initial uh, transmission, and that was significant, and it was significant in the way that it was paid for. It wasn't. It was paid for by land sales in the in these states where the road passed through a percentage of land sales of the federal land sales was able to be taken by the states to support the building of the road that was important um, and it did happen um, under the jefferson administration uh, the other thing that did happen is that you recall the constitutional uh, provision for the slave trade couldn't be banned before 1808. It was banned on January 1st, 1808. Uh, and with the support of Jefferson, uh, there was a debate in Congress about it. The Virginia slaveocracy objected with quite vehemence, but it went through. Um, so that is uh, 
significant uh, that it happened almost the same time as it happened in England. Um, but of course, there was little enforcement uh, that was associated with it. So it is estimated that slave trade really was able to continue if it was occurring in areas where the states didn't want to enforce the law. Uh, there were fines uh, levied if you carried out the slave trade and you were discovered. Uh, now, there were many other difficulties in this in the Jefferson period going into the Madison period internationally in terms there was pirate wars uh, from the uh, Mediterranean and there was war between France and England where they were interfering with US ships. Both the French and the British were doing what you've heard about in terms of impressment of seamen or seizing ships that were merchant ships that were being sent. So it was extremely fraught situation. And the fact that we didn't have a Navy because the budget was cut was uh, an issue during much of, the, of that decade. But there was continued to be stability in terms of the currency and some domestic trade into the when Jefferson implemented an embargo, a certain amount of a, ability to, for manufacturers to try to begin not with government support, but with a currency that allowed that kind of trade to go on. But it came up that the bank, First Bank of the United States, which when it was passed in 1791, uh, had a 20-year charter and it had to be rechartered uh, by 1811. And the thanks to the fact, and Gallatin wanted it rechartered, but thanks to the propaganda against the bank that had been, was on the record and was never retracted by Jefferson and his close associates, including Madison, there was a, the Congress passed the recharter, but it was uh, defeated in the Senate by the vote of the Vice President uh, of the United States. Now that brought to the fore something that was already going on, which was a faction of, de of Jefferson's party, who didn't like the fact that he was against manufacturing in the bank and didn't want to increase the tariff to support manufacturers, uh, that faction became extremely active. Uh, it was headed by this fellow Matthew Carey, who was an Irishman who came to this country under the, with the support of Franklin and Lafayette uh, back in the late 19, 1780s, um, and he was located in Philadelphia, and he was during this decade trying to get manufacturing going, uh, setting up societies and so forth, and when the bank was about to be, uh, was on the line, and it was very much not secure to be rechartered, uh, he went into hyper mode and wrote this piece called Desultory Reflections on the Ruinous Consequences of a Non-Renewal of the Bank of the United States, where he predicted that if the bank was not rechartered, there would be economic disaster. I don't know that he knew there was going to be a war of 1812, but uh, that if he had that was, because I haven't read this whole document, but I've read about it and this, he definitely indicated that there would be disastrous economic consequences. He was joined in this fight by a fellow by the name of Nicholas Biddle, also a Pennsylvania politician and future head of the Second Bank of the United States, who was also 
when uh, after this populist idea that the Bank of the United States was just for the rich, just benefiting the rich. Uh, and he said, without credit or money, while your commerce is stopped and your manufacturers languish, the total want of money, the demand for specie will be placed, will place the poorer classes at the mercy of the rich. Now, what that means is if you didn't have the bank putting, having bills of credit or scrip called on the Bank of the United States or state banks that were correspondent with the Bank of the United States, people you were doing business with would demand cash. And that was obviously a lot more onerous uh, and made it a lot more difficult to carry out trade and construction and setting up businesses and so forth, and to sell your goods as a farmer. This was not simply for those living in the city. Very much the farmers benefited from the fact that you could get credit. Now, they were unsuccessful, um, Biddle and Carey, uh, because the bank was uh, Recharter was defeated, and that meant that it was taken over by private hands, and there was a proliferate, and its place was taken by oodles of state banks with much riskier credit bases, uh, and that uh, the people who took over the actual bank uh, of the United States were private bankers who were ch charging a lot more of the government when it needed to borrow money. And very soon it needed to borrow money because we had the War of 1812, which launched a new era of history of the United States. This, and as the War of 1812 proceeded, it was clear that the United States, as Hamilton and Washington always said, uh, it was clear we weren't ready for a war. They, we didn't have the military capability, we didn't have the financial capability, we didn't have the roads, uh, we didn't, and without the bank, we didn't have the ammunition, we didn't have what it takes to mobilize an army. We didn't have the army. We didn't have the navy. Um, we were sitting ducks. Um, and I show the burning of the White House, just not that that has anything to do with the lack of supplies, but it was just the crowning insult. But I've read about the troop movements and activities of the states in the War of 1812, and they were just it wasn't as bad as the Revolutionary War, but it was bad. You couldn't get from, move troops from one place to another in any kind of timely fashion because there were no roads. Uh, the states themselves had to raise money because the federal government didn't have money to get troops uh, mobilized and so forth. So uh, what the bottom line is that the forecast of Matthew Carey that the elimination of the bank would result in disaster was brought home in a very serious way to a large part of the population. People began to realize that it would have been a good thing to keep that national bank as a way of supporting the necessary expenditures of the government. And Carey took up that question again. He was an incredible pamphleteer, <laughs> um, which he did all the way up to his death, uh, which was 1839. Um, then the document I'm showing you here, the olive branch, uh, was a series of pamphlets written between 1814, and they were constantly updated. This pamphlet took the nation by storm. It had at least 100,000 copies in its various iterations, and it was a 
on the one hand, a scathing attack on both parties, both Jefferson's party, which had been in power for the first decade, uh, for having eliminated the bank, for having eliminated the Navy, for having leaving us so unprepared, and the Federalist Party. And of this, Hamilton is an exception because he was not involved in these Federalist policies, which were effectively treasonous uh, in support of the British because they didn't want to have any uh, conflict with the British. So um, he went through a thorough scathing attack on both sides and said, look, we need now we need mutual forgiveness and harmony and a policy to bring the nation together. Uh, and with each iteration of, the, of a new pamphlet, new editing, he added more on what those policies should be, which were explicitly the policies of Alexander Hamilton. We needed to have the bank. We needed to have protection for our manufacturers. We needed to have support for our manufacturers uh, and build and use some of that money um, for the, use some government money for building of infrastructure to support those manufacturers. What we came up against and uh, is what the British did to follow on on the conclusion of the War of 1812. As you may be aware, the War of 1812 basically ended in a stalemate. Um, we didn't really gain a lot from it, except the moving of the British from the forts on our border. But um, the British did not give up. They Actually, the British Empire was still not reconciled to the independent existence of the United States, and certainly not as a manufacturing power. And what they did as the war ended was to flood the country again, as we saw back in the 1780s, with cheap imports. And this is one of the lords in the in the House of in the Parliament saying it's well worth while to incur a loss on the export of English manufacturers in order to stifle in the cradle the foreign manufacturers, i.e the manufacturers of the United States. This policy, of course, was also being carried out toward other countries and other colonies such as India, but this is uh, the explicit one for the United States. In other words, the, that Hamiltonian policy was straight up against British policy, uh, and it was a war. Now, they did succeed in uh, Kerry's campaign and that of others did succeed in establishing a second national bank. It was larger than the first with more government bonds used as the bulk of the capital base, three quarters of the capital base with one quarter being specie. And that bank, but that bank really began uh, on a very, with incompetent leadership the first three years were really a mess, not only because they were facing that British warfare, which they were bound to face, the financial warfare, but also uh, because first they were too loose with their credit and then they were too tight with their credit. So it was a, uh, turned out to be quite problematic. However, um, that was only one aspect of the fight to return to a Hamiltonian policy. Another part was the desire to get government support to build the infrastructure of the country. Now, this may be surprising to some of you. John Calhoun is mostly known for his raving secessionist uh, defense of slavery. But back in 1817, that was not his character. He hadn't gone in that direction yet. He was very much an ally of Matthew Carey and others who were in Matthew Carey's camp, including Henry Clay, 
and uh, others. So he is in the House of Representatives at this time, and he pushes when the bank is reestablished, it pays a $1.5 million bonus, you know, uh, to the government, I guess, in return for getting the charter. And Calhoun says, okay, we're getting this bonus, this unexpected money, let's use it to build infrastructure. Um, and because we've just seen that we desperately need to connect sections of the country, both for our national defense and our commerce. And what he says is this, you know, we occupy a surface prodigiously great in proportion to our numbers. The common strength is brought to bear with great difficulty on the point. He was, he in the future was secretary of war, but not right now on the point it, it, that may be menaced by the, an enemy, let us bind the Republic together with a perfect system of roads and canals. Let us conquer space. But of course, what he means by space uh, is not what we mean today, but uh, it was critical. Now, what is going on on slavery at this point? Um, the, there was, from what I can tell, there was more participation of uh, African Americans in the War of 1812 than there was in the Revolutionary War. There was very significant um, African American representation, particularly in the Navy, and more and more, you know, because of the loosening of the laws, uh, in general, more and more. Uh, Blacks were going, uh, were being freed. There was an increasing percentage of free blacks in the country. And this, and many of them went north. And when there were economic problems, uh, there was competition for jobs. And there was uh, also difficulty in them supporting themselves and prejudice. So um, in 1817, the American Colonization Society is established. And this is really, uh, I could spend hours talking about this, but I'm gonna be brief. The, they were a real mishmash. The guy, the initial guy who started it wanted, definitely was anti-slavery from the standpoint of sympathy for blacks, and but saw the only solution is having uh, free blacks have a place they could live without oppression in Africa. And the other people, and in fact, a lot of others from the South who were not about to uh, give up slavery, but did not want to have free blacks around, providing a bad example for their continued enslaved, supported the American Colonization Society because they wanted to get rid of free blacks, period. Um, kick them out, get them out there, uh, and pay to do it. So, but this society actually had an incredible amount of high level support. I mean, President Monroe, Madison, Matthew Carey, et cetera, et cetera, from all different, um, points of view. Uh, there were, you know, local states passed resolutions. Uh, some of them said this is the first step to end slavery because, you know, and others said we don't want to end slavery, but we don't want to have free blacks around. But it was a very active concern and it uh, has to be taken into account. Uh, William Lloyd Garrison, uh, the, the firebrand, was initially a member of it, but he quit fairly soon. And eventually the blacks that were involved with it, and there were blacks involved with it, uh, decided that this was not a good idea. Um, and it became less and less of a, uh, of a force in the situation. But it did succeed in doing some things. Um, for example, really escalating the crackdown on the slave trade. Uh, one of the guys who passed through uh, 
government support for the state of Liberia, um, which is the American Colonization Society uh, sponsored, was uh, successfully got through this anti-piracy law, for, which finally put some teeth into what happened if you were caught as a slave ship. Uh, you could be put to death because piracy involved, you know, piracy carried the death penalty. Um, so there was a tightening in that regard. Um, but, you know, incredible tension. And the tension increases with economic uh, crisis. And there was another economic crisis in 1819. Uh, as a result, mostly of the British, two things, the British warfare, uh, economic warfare of flooding the country and bankrupting the manufacturers, uh, the dysfunctionality of the bank and helping the manufacturers and others here, um, and also the fact that the wars had ended in Europe in 1815, and the kind of market that was available here in Europe from the United States was no longer as large because Europe was able to get back to work, so to speak, as opposed to simply be supplied fighting the war. Um, but there, in the course of that crisis, new significant measures were taken uh, to try to move in the Hamiltonian direction. Uh, one of the most significant was the ruling on the constitutionality of the National Bank done by John Marshall in 1819. Um, this happened because Merrill, the state of Maryland tried to tax the bank, uh, probably because they were having financial difficulties, uh, and uh, Marshall said, no, um, you, this is a national bank and the national uh, nation takes precedence here. And that if the principles advocated by the state of Maryland would, were put forward, would, were implemented, this would essentially change the Constitution, render the government of the Union incompetent for the objects for which it was instituted, i.e. prosperity, economic prosperity and defense, and place all its powers under the control of the state legislatures. It would be in a great measure, it would in a great measure reinstate the old confederation. Now who objected to that ruling? And, and Marshall used Hamiltonian arguments, but without using Hamilton by name. That was a, those were, Hamilton was fighting words to the, to many people. So, but the South responded as if the establishment of the National Bank was a threat to slavery. Um, very important for you to realize that just both the British imperial system and the slaveocracy leadership saw the manufacturing policy as a threat to their existence. Uh, and this was a, uh, this guy, Spencer Roan, was from Richmond and Virginia and head of something called the Virginia Richmond Junto, uh, which opposed everything of the American system or Hamiltonian system of economics. Things were also very hot per se on the slavery issue. Um, 1820, you may recall, is the year of the Missouri Compromise. What precipitated the, the Missouri Compromise? Uh, with the Missouri Compromise being a, allowing the expansion of slavery west of the Mississippi officially uh, into Missouri, uh, which only happened, of course, with uh, by Maine being let in as a free state. But why did that fight even happen? Um, because this fellow Talmadge, a New York congressman, uh, tried to introduce an amendment banning the slavery uh, expansion. 
uh, in Missouri uh, and freeing all slaves in Missouri after uh, the slaves became 25. I mean, this was still the, cus the custom. It sort of left over from the indentured servitude regime and so forth. So uh, this caused, of course, a huge uproar um, that uh, ultimately resulted in the compromise. But it was clearly the development question and the slavery question were, were joined at the hip, as you would say today. And Matthew Carey continued um, to and his allies um, to agitate for the full Hamiltonian program. Uh, he continues to publish. He puts together his um, essays into a, a book on national economy. He reprints whole sections of Hamilton's report on manufactures and says these principles of political economy, which I could get, I could send you the list of them there there, uh, I could send you a document about that if you want. Uh, you know, you have to have an industrial nation which can support it, its essential activity uh, and welfare of its population. Um, you have to protect your manufacturers. Uh, you can't have free trade because there is no such thing as equal power in this international marketplace. Now, coming off this, he is successful for a while. And he's successful starting in 1824. This is the Hamiltonian revival uh, with the passage of a Survey Act, which is the first time the Army Corps of Engineers is empowered to begin to build, uh, not only scope out, but build infrastructure, canals, railroads, and so forth. Again, who objects? Uh, the Virginia slaveocracy, John Randolph. Uh, if Congress can do this, they eman emancipate every slave in the United States. Really come into this whole American system, really comes into its own for the second time after the Washington administration with John Quincy Adams, who of course is anti-slavery um, and pro economic development, pro-manufacturing, pro-infrastructure, pro-government support for all that. And he is supported in the Congress by Henry Clay, uh, who emphasizes his fight for the tariff to defend manufacturing uh, and defines the American system as the national bank, uh, the uh, tariff, and internal improvements i.e. infrastructure uh, being paid for by the government, that that's what's required. When they talk about this, they don't say this will end slavery, but in fact, these are preconditions for ending slavery. And you do see the canal era take off in this period. Um, this is the Monocacy Aqueduct there in Maryland, probably many of you have seen. It goes back to 1841, I think is when it was opened. It's been restored, of course, but it's the basic structure is there. And the railroad era also begins. And these uh, projects which pull the country together, uh, begin to pull the country together, are supported by the federal government, especially through the uh, Army Corps of Engineers and their engineering and also through the bank of the second bank of the United States, which is stabilizing credit, keeping inflation under control, joining together with, uh, empowered by the Congress to join together to help finance, provide capital for companies carrying this out, uh, and creating the basis for an industrial nation, which is seen as and is actually a threat to the slaveocracy. Another actor in this is Friedrich List. I really don't have the time to discuss him. I don't know why I decided to put him in there, except that he's a tremendous, he's another, he's a German who's here for about four years, active in Pennsylvania. Uh, 
doing pamphlets and agitating to uh, to get the this the American system in process. And he, like others um, in this period, is much more explicit on the fact that what occurs is a uh, in industrializing is raising the whole level of culture and education uh, and potential for the population. It's productive power we want. We don't want just money. We want the productive power to be able to produce for the future for future generations. Uh, the, the big tariff is passed in 1828 um, and that creates uh, a new crisis. That's the so-called tariff of abominations, and it's a complicated story, but it does begin to escalate. You know, it creates a political crisis, uh, but it is also beneficial to the manufacturing sector. But um, the political crisis is what brings Andrew Jackson to the fore. He gets elected in 1828. And who is Andrew Jackson? Well, Andrew Jackson is Lincoln is uh, Jefferson on steroids, I would say. Um, he's the guy who agrees with Jefferson that uh, the federal government should have nothing to do with the economy. Um, and he, of course, is a slave owner, unlike John Quincy Adams. Uh, and he is hostile uh, to many of the uh, basic requirements to advance the economy and end slavery. He is not his own man, however, when it comes to his political uh, career. Uh, his political career is sponsored from New York uh, by the machine run by Martin Van Buren. And New York at this point uh, is always more than one thing. I say New York City, really, here, but not just New York City. His, uh, I think his base was actually up in Albany. But um, this, this New York machine is very much connected uh, to the Wall Street banking uh, consortia and to Aaron Burr, ironically, <laughs> who's come back to the United States under keeping a low profile um, and is active again. So Jackson is hostile to credit. Um, he wants everyone to pay cash for everything, which of course, from the standpoint of the of, of everybody, from a businessman to a farmer uh, to a taxpayer, um, is a problem um, that you have to come up with uh, gold in order to pay your bills, you can't get credit uh, to ship across the country and to do what, uh, to carry out your business. And he is also hostile to infrastructure spending. One of the first things he does, which is highly controversial, but it flies, was to veto part of the national road. And he, it's called the Maysville Pike. Now, this is of interest from the standpoint of ultimate secession because, yes, it's all within, this particular pike is all within uh, Kentucky, but it connects, it was part of the national road that went up into Ohio and went on into Indiana. So, and it is obviously going into the south, which is uh, something which is would help break down the grow, what was a growing barrier then, or a growing discrepancy between the North and the South. The North is in a, you know, more industrialized, and the South is clinging to the plantation system. Jackson's big focus uh, decides to make a crusade against the Second Bank of the United States, uh, which was at the heart of financial stability and the growing manufacturing operation. And he ends up uh, vetoing 
the recharter because again it had to be rechartered it was established for 20 years in 1816 had to be rechartered in 1836 and um, they applied early and uh, he carried out a you know, smear campaign about uh, rich people and ended up uh, succeeding in winning re-election in 1832 and in uh, shutting off the bank with disastrous consequences. Uh, ultimately for the economy, they weren't totally felt until uh, Van Buren in 1837, but this was uh, what he did in shutting off the killing the second bank of the United States was to return the United States to financial chaos and it, and again unfettered, more unfettered domination by the major financial powers on the uh, globe, which were the British banks operating in many cases through the New York banks. So the result, as has been documented by many writers on the financial system, was not to empower the little guy, which is what Jackson said he was doing. Uh, it did proliferate a lot of state banks, but many of them you know, were fly-by-night operations that lost people's money because there was no uh, uh, there was no oversight uh, of any responsible sort. They were what's called wildcat banking. Um, but the result was to increase in power in uh, the financial centers, particularly New York City, and in the correspondent banks in Britain. Uh, and this raised the alarm um, in this, uh, among those who understood the relationship between an economy uh, and the, the needs of the country uh, to have a growing industrial economy uh, and to be unified around that. Uh, John Quincy Adams is one of the ones who really put that forward. He was at that point the head of, he'd gone back to Congress after he left the president, was kicked out of the presidency, was head of the Manufacturers Committee. Um, and he said of Jackson's veto that this, uh, he's referring at the beginning here to what Jackson said in the, his veto. He said, where he, Jackson said, you know, it's not the bankers and the, and the manufacturers and the merchants who are the country. It is uh, the independent farmers or planters. But, uh, and the way that John Quincy Adams put it is, uh, however, in one portion of the union, the independent farmers or planters cultivating the soil by their slaves may be considered by one of themselves as the basis of society. If you consider them the basis of society, um, and you consider them the best part of the population, that assumption as a foundation of a system of national policy for the future government of the United States is an occurrence of the most dangerous and alarming tendency as threatening not only the prosperity and peace of the country and leading most directly to the most fatal of catastrophes, the dissolution of the Union by a complicated civil and several war. So what he's saying is you're going to end up with war if you don't have an industrialization policy to hold the country together. And in the consequence of this, the grip of slavery tightens. Uh, Carey, Carey, this is the son of Matthew Carey, he gets involved in the fight. Uh, and he says from the day of Jackson dismantling the bank and that system, the with it grew the domestic slave trade and the pro-slavery feeling. Of course, this wasn't helped by Nat Turner's revolt, 
uh, which occurred right around the time this was happening. The bank fight is happening 1831 to 1833. Uh, Nat Turner's revolt happens in 1831. Uh, this is the only one of these major revolts that actually results in significant death of white people. Uh, but it obviously was quite serious. But it, it not, did not immediately result in and it immediately resulted in a debate <laughs> um, about the possible abolition of slavery because it was clear that you had a very large slave population, larger, more blacks than whites in many parts of these southern states, um, and that uh, it was a real danger um, that if you continued this system that you were going to have a revolt. Warnings have been made of this all the way back to the beginning of the anti-slavery uh, material that we've seen. The most uh, celebrated discussion in the wake of this, uh, of the uh, Nat Turner revolt, which could ha of course happened in Virginia, I don't, I don't want to assume you know that, uh, was in the Virginia House of Delegates, where they actually discussed and had on the table uh, the possibility of, of the abolition of slavery. Uh, Quakers introduced petitions, others introduced petitions, um, and, it, and there was a debate for days uh, as to, it was not a debate on the abolition of slavery, it was a debate on whether to discuss the abolition of slavery. Um, but it, uh, it was the most serious kind of debate that was, uh, and the only, from what I've read, uh, debate on that level in policy, in areas of government, in institutions of government, in the history of the United States. I just found out recently that there was also uh, consideration in the uh, legislature of Maryland around this time and uh, the legislature of North Carolina about abolishing slavery. Now, there's a question of how much of this ab abolition was going to be related to uh, sending the, the blanks to Liberia, uh, which is a slight uh, complication. Uh, or worse, but um, but this did not succeed. They did not end up. The, the governor, that guy I was just showing you, actually had in his private notes that he intended his, re his rule as governor to preside over the beginning of abolition of slavery. But that isn't what resulted. It ended up in a stalemate. And then after the stalemate, a tightening of the laws. Uh, this is the point where it's actually around in this 1830s period, the exact period where, co where cotton really takes off uh, to uh, where it becomes a crime for blacks to, to uh, be able to read, to go to church, you know, and preach and so forth and so on. And this of course gets even worse uh, under conditions of the economic crisis of 1837, which is a direct result of Jackson's actions. Throughout this entire period, this is the last thing I want to go through. Um, of course, there it's obvious to anybody who's looking around and to a lot of people in the South that uh, the South is very much impoverished by the continuation of slavery and the uh, lack of manufactures. These charts, which I'm showing you, are comparisons of the North and the South on three areas, uh, manufacturers, education, and infrastructure. They were in a book written in 1857 by a Southern man named Hinton Helper. It's a long book, it's, but it's available in, uh, for free on the internet. And, you know, he is a rabid abolitionist. I wrote a, a report on him in my blog. Uh, 
and just recently, if you want to look at that, um, he's not a, uh, he's also, it appears, uh, a fairly bad racist. Um, but in this book, he doesn't say anything bad about blacks. He doesn't say they're inferior or, you know, they're barbarian or bestial or this or that. He says the problem that we face in the South is that we have continued slavery. Why is the North so much more prosperous than we are? Because we have slavery and that the slaveholders are robbers, they're criminals, uh, they they should not be compensated for getting rid of their blacks. We have to have total abolition. Um, and he, he would like, you know, to pay, actually, give reparations to the blacks, uh, but he'd like a bunch of that money to go to them going to Liberia. But this just show. but the reason I mention this is, it, this was a very big deal politically at the time, but the reason I really mention it is because it was totally obvious throughout the South that the slave system was not only immoral, but it was also impoverishing the entire South, white people, black people, and so forth. This shows you the comparison. Just look at the comparison of the uh, number of miles of railroads, 19,000 to 9,700, the number of canals, 4,000 miles to 1,000 miles. Uh, it's not even to mention the lack of connection between North and South. And then education. I mean, to have an, a manufacturing society, you need to have an educated workforce. Look at how many people were in school. 581,000 pupils in the South states, 22 million 700 in the Northern states. There was no education system. And the, but the leadership in the South was determined to prevent manufacturing. Uh, and this is just a quote from the, the, of defense in 1858 of the continuing the slaveocracy system. We must prevent the increase of manufacturers, force the surplus labor into agriculture, promote the cultivation of our unimproved Western lands until provisions are so multiplied and reduced in price that slave can, the slave can be fed so cheaply as to enable us to grow our sugar at three cents a pound. Then without protective duties, we can rival Cuba. In other words, we can win the race to the bottom uh, by continuing slavery uh, and, you know, people's welfare be damned. So now, you know, the alternative to this was industrialization. And this Henry Carey, the son of Matthew, writes about how to abolish slavery in a book in 1853. And he says, whatever tends to increase the power of man to associate with his neighbor man tends to promote the growth of commerce and to, produ and to produce that material, moral, and intellectual improvement that leads to freedom. To enable men to exercise that power is the object of protection, i.e. tariffs. The men of this country, therefore, who desire that all men, black, white, and brown, shall at the earliest period enjoy perfect freedom of thought, speech, action, and trade, will find on full consideration that duty to themselves and to their fellow men requires they should advocate efficient protection as the true and only mode of abolishing the domestic trade in slaves, whether black or white. And what he's talking about is raising the investment. He says, raise the value of man, raise the investment in living standards, raise the, you know, investment in education and in, in food and uh, conditions of life for everyone. And his argument was that if this had happened to connect Maryland, Virginia, Carolina, Kentucky, Tennessee, with the rest of the nation, it would gradually have made it impossible to maintain the slave system. Get there to be manufacturers. Helper, that guy Hinton Helper who wrote that book actually has example, an example of a manufacturer who was run out of Richmond, Virginia. Uh, 
because uh, and went back to set up his factory in the north because they didn't want to have manufacturers. They didn't want to have significant cities. Um, now, of course, not all, it's not all economic, right, uh, per se. Uh, it depends really on the, the idea of what you think mankind is, both black and white. And I'm just going to conclude with a uh, quote from Matthew, from Henry Carey, where he is talking about the importance of credit, uh, i.e., like the Bank of the United States, uh, and attacking those who oppose credit. And he says, um, the people who oppose it and say we have to just uh, deal with gold and silver are, uh, are they are economists who regard man as an animal who must be fed and will procreate and that can be made to work only under the pressure of a strong necessity. Were they, however, to look for once at the real man the being made in the image of his creator and capable of almost infinite elevation, they would perhaps arrive at a conclusion widely different. The desires of that man are infinite, and the more they are gratified, the more rapidly do they increase in number. The miserable Hottentot dispenses with a road of any kind, but the enlightened and intelligent people of other countries are seen passing in succession from the ordinary village road to the turnpike and thence to the railroad. And the better the existing communications, the greater is the thirst for further improvement. The better the schools and houses, the greater is the desire for superior teachers and further additions to the comforts of the dwelling. And he goes on. Um, but since I've taken so much time, I think I should stop. This was not implemented, of course, until Abraham Lincoln. And I just want to give you the way you can reach me, that you can read more about Hamilton, that you can write to me. I'll put that in the chat as well. And that is what I should stop because I wanted to give a comprehensive class, but it was a bit long. I'm sorry. <laughs> Nancy, thank you very much for your classes. They were very enlightening. And, and uh, you know, it's a part we pass over in history, really quickly, American history. You sort of go one, two, three, and then you're at the Civil War. And, and I, I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Re. Hi, uh, this is a pretty broad question, but what advice would you give to uh, our, let's say, elementary school systems for children to learn that they're not learning now? On oh, this subject. I'm not going to fall into that one. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I'll, please, I'm not trying to get into whatever political stuff. But what, what are you, what's your sense that is missing for the for children? Oh, I think the whole idea that there was an American system that was not the same as Adam Smith um, was is missing from our education and has been missing for probably at least a century. Um, people tend to think, I mean, think of how people discuss finance in the world. It's the Anglo-American system and it's the rest of the world, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, we started off against the Anglo system and there were good reasons for that. And the, uh, because it was an imperial system not that everything in Britain was bad, but, but that the finance uh, was, uh, was an imperial finance and that, and it captured part of our economy. 
and that was increasingly focused in the South. So I think the, the key thing that I would say is there's no, we need people to understand there was such a thing as the American system. That's why I wrote the book I wrote about Hamilton, that there was an American system distinct from, from, from the British system. And if people don't understand that, which today they just don't, I mean, I've addressed, I've addressed very educated audiences at the U.S. Treasury, right? I've got them on my thing. I, I gave a speech to the Treasury Historical Association. They never heard of Henry Carey. I mean, this guy was an international uh, phenomenon who was read, you know, all around the world and helped credited with the fact that coming out of the Civil War, we were an economic giant, right? Which, you know, totally challenging. By the end of that cent last century, we were outstripping Great Britain. And the economics of that was initiated in the Lincoln administration was known to be the cause of that. So it's very well known. And, um, and it's been effectively, what well, hasn't been totally wiped out. There's been some revival in the recent period, uh, and certain, even certain people in the Republican Party and so forth and so on, talking about the American system. But it's still a little bit, you know, dicey in terms of, of my, in my, under, you know, my understanding of it. Um, but I think that's where we have to, to go. People should understand um, Hamilton. They should understand, you know, Henry Clay and the economics of the American system. Susan? Yeah, this is a more specific question. Did I hear you say that uh, the number of blacks in Virginia outnumbered the, the number of whites? And if that's true, is, was that true throughout the Southern states? Um, it was definitely true. And that's something I, I would have to look up again what periods in which that was the case. Uh, but what I was just reading a review book about, I'm pretty sure that in the period we're talking about, the 30s and 40s, uh, Virginia was reaching that point. I mean, South Carolina had reached that point in the early 18th century uh, of having more blacks than whites and probably um, probably Georgia shortly thereafter um, because of the importation. But, uh, but Virginia, you know, got into the slave breeding business, you know, at a certain point, and they very much uh, had that, um, uh, they very much had uh, a lot of, a lot of blacks, yeah. But I can't, I specify it too much because it's just something that I know South Carolina. I don't, I didn't, I haven't really, you often have to look at numerous sources for even the basic statistical information uh, because people vary on what they think the statistics actually were at the time. Um, but it can be looked up in the, um, we did have census records in those periods. So why don't you just look at the census, you know, and you, you probably find uh, yeah. a reasonably accurate. But I think that it did get to that point. How fearful I, was, were the, oh, I'm sorry. Who's talking? Was that you, Susan, or was it somebody yeah. else? Yeah, I started, I didn't no, want I to saw, interrupt. No, I, no, I think we started at the same time. Go, go ahead. That's why I raised my hand. But no, oh, go mind. ahead. I didn't see. Oh, go ahead, Elizabeth. Elizabeth? Okay. Uh, when we talk about Virginia and the growth of the children or the African-American population in Virginia 
in the 1830s is when Virginia began, and that might be the reason why, to tighten the you know, noose around the African Americans, not to learn to read, not to write, because before that they did learn some reading and some writing, the slaves. But suddenly, yeah, yeah, and this after after that. Uh, after that rebellion, the Nat Turner Rebellion, he was an educated preacher, right? Right, right. And they said, oh boy, it's dangerous to teach these people to read. Yeah. And um, yeah. that's- There's a marvelous book written by a um, judge that came out in the 1970s, 80s. I believe it's called In the Matter of Color. And it talks, it talks about the laws that were rewritten and how they were rewritten. He did all that research on it. He was a judge in Virginia. It's a marvelous book. I was looking for it, but I couldn't find it. But when I find it, anybody's interested in reading what happened in Virginia with the tightening uh, of the noose around the African-American snack, that's a book to read. And um, if you're interested in that kind of thing, anyway. To me, what you said today told us, it makes me think a little bit, and I know we don't have slaves anymore, but when we talk about industry and not wanting the industry, I think when we went to China, I think we began unmantling some of our industry and how many industries closed. And I've come to the conclusion many years ago, we should have gone to South America and Bill, think about our continent and South American continent, how strong we would be together. But all our stuff comes from China. So much comes from China. So anyway, just the, just the point, how much it reminded me in some ways of what you were saying about the industry and this. Oh, I'm glad because, because I, it does have that connection. Um, the, uh, we used to have a different idea in, in the post-Lincoln period uh, those of you who were in previous classes heard me talk about this some. Um, there was a, uh, to, to spread the American system and to try to get other countries to have, to do the same thing and to develop their industries. I mean, nowadays there's too much of a tendency to say, you know, if they're developing their high technology industries, that's competitive with us and we don't want it. We don't want it. But the American system used to have more of an idea of everybody being prosperous helps everybody else. Um, and that is an idea that I think um, could, well, could well use to be revived today. Yes, I like Elizabeth. To, I'd like to make one other comment. I lived in the South for 30 years, in spirit, uh, 15 years or so in Charleston, South Carolina. And when you began your talk, I believe it was your first time, it made me think of some of my patients because I worked out on the barrier islands of South Carolina, Edisto and those islands. Not sure if anybody has ever gone, a marvelous island. And I have. Most of my patients were African American patients, and this was in the 19, late 1970s. They could not read and they couldn't write because education, when they were growing up, was terrible in South Carolina. And there is a book written about Septima Clark, and she was an educator on those islands in the 20s. Anyway, it, that's how far back we have gone. I mean, that's how it went for people not to learn to read and write in the South. Right. Because you were talking about education in the North. Well, no, I was talking about education in the South, yeah, the both. comparison. You did both, right. The, I mean, the people who wanted to follow a Hamilton-like tradition in Virginia, for example, were totally mm -hmm. upset about the fact that that Virginia was so behind in education. 
Sure. I mean, everybody makes a big deal that Jefferson really liked education. Well, Jefferson <laughs> was very, was not, but he wasn't committed to primary school education. He was committed to education for the elite. That's right. And he, uh, I just heard recently that, I, mean, I haven't read any about this recently, but when he established the University of Virginia, I mean, they fired people who had Hamiltonian policies. They fired people who came from the North. They really, I mean, Jefferson had a real problem as to whether his real country was the United States or Virginia, uh, you know, from, uh, and we see reflected in some of our problems later on uh, the influence that he, you know, the fact that ideas don't often don't die. You know, they they keep going <laughs> unless they've been shown to uh, to lead to disaster. And we haven't shown enough people yet that uh, certain ideas lead to disaster. Sean here. Uh, comment. Uh, if you look at the numbers today for the South, they're pretty darn poor still. Uh, they just had the governor of one state taking the COVID money to build more jails. You know, there's something about the mindset of the political elite in some of these places. Right. Well, the um, that's true. Uh, there's a very I don't know whether I should go into this or not, but the at the beginning of Henry Carey's book on how to extinguish slavery, um, he starts off by attacking the way slavery was eliminated in the British colonies in the British Isle in the Brit in the Caribbean, right? Mm. Um, and I was sort of shocked by this. And then I realized what he was actually saying, what he was saying, he, he said, he actually said the condition of the slaves was worse off after they eliminated slavery. But the reason was that they didn't replace sla the slave plantations with any productive activity. They didn't invest in creating any jobs. So the freed slaves, I mean, it sort of reminded me of what happened, you know, in sharecropping in the South, you know, after the elimination of slavery, although it was nowhere near as bad here as it was there. They just sort of let, okay, now you're free, go rot, right? Because there are no jobs, there is no support, there are no cities, and so forth. And he's making the point that you've got to have uh, you've got to invest in an economy. You've got to invest in people. You've got to invest in their education. You've got to invest in their uh, housing. You've got to invest in their transportation and have it, you know, he's very much of the idea that man is a social being. He's not just this isolated individual out to so serve his particular, uh, you know, pleasures. Um, he is some he's a social being and you build a society and we all depend upon that. And our, our positive uh, contribution to that is what brings increasing freedom for everybody. Um, so, uh, so yes, I mean, we have incredible legacies of, of this system, uh, but it, to me, it's critical to understand mm -hmm. that there is a an economic system behind it, uh, and uh, an economic system based on a certain idea of of what mankind is and should be uh, that has to be gone after directly, and um, or if not directly, at least have be in mind when you go after it, so that. Uh, so you're not just screaming at somebody, but that you address their ultimate uh, humanity uh, yeah. underneath it all. <laughs>
Elizabeth? Yeah. Going back to my patients, what was most interesting to me uh, was um, that they couldn't just read and write. They lived in houses that had only slush buckets and one water line. And most of them were grandparents who were raising their grandchildren because the daughters or sons had gone north to work in the north to have jobs. That was just amazing to me down there. And that was in the 70s, late 70s when I went there. Because they couldn't get the jobs down there in the south like they could up, go up north. Even then. Let me, um, so I've enjoyed this very much. I'd be happy to be in touch with any of you. I would love to sell you books. I would love to have you review, read books, my book, review it on Amazon. Um, keep studying, write to me. Um, and if all goes well, maybe I'll teach another class someday. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Nancy. I hope you will teach another class in the spring. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Yeah. Hey, hey, Sean, did you ever read the book? Thank you, 